on World News Tonight. The G7 meets. US and allies look for ways to starve Russia for energy revenues as Zelensky speaks to G7. Continued shelling. Russia makes headway in Donbass as Kyiv reels from the first Russian strikes in weeks. Climate crisis. Extreme heat is being experienced across the globe as Japan falls under a power crunch. And it's the dancing devils. Venezuela celebrates with their traditional dancers in a way to receive blessings. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Now, leaders of the G7 summit are in Germany for their annual summit. Topping their agenda is the war in Ukraine, of course, and the group has already agreed on a new ban on Russian gold exports as the commodity is a significant source of revenue for the country. And the goal here is to hurt Moscow's ability to fund the war in Ukraine. As Russian missiles exploded in Ukraine's capital Sunday, leaders from the G7, the group of seven rich democracies, gathered for a summit in Germany. U.S. President Joe Biden condemned the Kyiv strike. As Europe's biggest land conflict since World War II enters its fifth month, the Western alliance supporting Kyiv has been starting to show signs of strain, with leaders fretting about the growing economic cost. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson urged the West to stay united. You know, this is something that we're, it's, it's worth us standing up for together. And that is the principle that a free, independent, sovereign country like Ukraine should not be violently invaded and should not have its boundaries changed by force. At the start of the meeting, four of the nations moved to ban imports of Russian gold to tighten the sanctions squeeze on Moscow. In the wake of the conflict in Ukraine, which began on February 24th, global energy and food prices have soared. These issues were also top of mind, said German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. All members are concerned about the crisis of falling growth rates in some countries, rising inflation, raw material shortages and disrupted supply changes. These aren't small challenges, he said. G7 leaders also relaunched an initiative to finance needed infrastructure in developing countries. Today we officially launched the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. We collectively have dozens of projects already underway around the globe. And I'm proud to announce the United States will mobilize $200 billion in public and private capital over the next five years for that partnership. Over five years, the group pledged $600 billion in private and public funds for the initiative. The move was aimed at countering China's older, multi-trillion dollar Belt and Road project. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky will urge world powers to step up their support for Ukraine when he addresses the G7 summit. As Kyiv reels from the first Russian strikes on the capital in weeks, Russian forces meanwhile are setting their sights on full control of Luhansk region after taking the strategic city of Severodonetsk. Russian missiles struck the Ukrainian capital Kyiv on Sunday in the first such attack on the city in weeks. Up to four explosions rang out in the city centre in the early hours of the morning. Buildings smouldered and the streets were covered in debris. Ukraine's police chief Ihor Klimenko said at least five people had been wounded. Authorities said several people were trapped in the rubble of destroyed buildings. Footage shared by Ukraine's Ministry of Emergency showed a seven-year-old girl being carried out of a damaged building on a stretcher. The renewed strikes on Kyiv come as world leaders from G7 countries gather in Europe to discuss further sanctions against Moscow. The Western alliance supporting Kyiv has been starting to show signs of strain as leaders fret about the growing economic cost, including surging food and energy prices. Life had been returning to normal in Kyiv after fierce resistance held off Russian advances in the early phase of the war. There had been no major strikes since the start of June. 
Russia's defense ministry said on Sunday that it had hit training centers in the Ukrainian regions of Chernihiv, Zhitomir and Lviv, an apparent reference to strikes reported by Ukraine on Saturday. There was no immediate comment about Sunday's strikes on Kyiv. It released video showing missiles being launched. Russia denies targeting civilians and says it targets military infrastructure. Ukraine and the West accuse Russian forces of war crimes in a conflict that has killed thousands, sent millions fleeing from Ukraine and destroyed cities. Iran's indirect talks with the United States on reviving the 2015 nuclear pact will resume soon. The Iranian foreign minister said amid a push by the European Union's top diplomat to break a months-long impasse in the negotiations. Talks to revive Iran's nuclear deal appear back on track, thanks to a surprise visit by the European Union foreign policy chief, Joseph Borrell. In the coming days, when I'm saying the coming days, I mean immediately, we will restart the discussions, stop for the last three months. That's a good news, and let's hope that this will bring the GCPA again on track. The US and Iran will not talk directly, but through EU mediators, including Borrell. The negotiations began in Vienna in April last year, but hit a snag in March, notably over a demand by Tehran that its Islamic Revolutionary Guard be removed from a US terror list. Iran's foreign minister also said the issue of sanctions needed to be resolved. What is key for the Islamic Republic of Iran is the full economic benefit from the agreement concluded in 2015. We hope that the US side, this time round, makes responsible and committed efforts to reach an agreement. Earlier this month, the International Atomic Energy Agency censured Iran after traces of enriched uranium were found at three nuclear sites. On the same day, Tehran disconnected dozens of IAEA surveillance cameras, a move the agency warned could be a fatal blow to efforts to revive the 2015 nuclear deal. South Korean President Yoon suk yeol will depart from Spain for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization Summit set for this week during the trip, which will mark his debut on the multilateral diplomatic stage since taking office last month. President Yoon will take part in the trilateral summit with his U.S. and Japanese counterparts. The leaders of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan will sit down for a trilateral summit on Wednesday in Spain on the sidelines of a NATO summit. No such trilateral summit has taken place for the past five years or so amid strained ties between Seoul and Tokyo. Yet relations between the two Asian neighbors have shown signs of improvement since Yoon took office as South Korea's president, pledging to improve ties with Japan. While there was speculation that Yoon could hold a one-on-one -on -one meeting with his Japanese counterpart in Spain, no such meeting, whether in the form of an official summit or a pool-aside meeting, is likely to take place. During the scheduled trilateral summit, the three countries are expected to discuss an array of issues, including the security situation on the Korean Peninsula. There are a total of 14 diplomatic functions scheduled for Yoon in Madrid, including the NATO summit, during which he will underscore the importance of the denuclearization of North Korea. While Seoul is not a member of the military alliance, it has been invited as a partner along with other countries such as Japan, Australia and New Zealand. Yoon is also expected to hold a series of bilateral meetings with leaders from Canada, Poland, the Netherlands and Denmark to discuss ways to expand economic cooperation. First Lady Kim Gun hee plans to accompany Yoon on his first overseas visit. She plans to attend sessions for the leader's spouses and other events, including a guided tour of the royal palace, as well as a dinner with Korean residents in Spain. It is clear that an already divided American nation has only become further incensed by the rapidly changing landscape of abortion rights after the Supreme Court struck down Roe v. Wade. People of both sides of the country are taking to the streets with almost all marchers being peaceful. Tonight, a nation divided and on edge. Peaceful protests over abortion rights punctuated by isolated incidents of vandalism and violence. 
Windows smashed at the Vermont State House. In Colorado, a Christian pregnancy center threatened and burned. In Providence, an off duty officer charged with assault allegedly seen in this video punching an abortion rights demonstrator, who was also his Democratic opponent in a state Senate race. Tensions running high as a growing number of states start enforcing bans on abortion, with few exceptions. Eight states tonight have near total bans in force. Eleven states have no clinics performing abortions. Former President Trump, who put three justices on the court to overturn Roe v. Wade, taking a victory lap in Illinois. The court handed down a victory for the Constitution, a victory for the rule of law, and above all, a victory for life. Trump stumping for Republican Congresswoman Mary Miller, who said this. I want to thank you for the historic victory for white life in the Supreme Court yesterday. Miller's spokesman refuting claims of racism, calling it a mix-up of words. Both sides in the debate on knife's edge. When former President Obama tweeted criticism of the court's reversal of 50 years of precedent, Republican Senator John Cornyn of Texas fired back, now do Plessy v. Ferguson, Brown v. Board of Education, the decision upholding segregation and the one that ended it. Cornyn batting down cries of racism, tweeting, thank goodness some precedents are overturned. Largely unseen and unheard in the firestorm, the low-income and minority women who are most likely to seek abortion care, like Nicole, who we met at an abortion clinic in Mississippi. You don't want to bring it. You're scared. And it's just not something that my husband and I are ready for. We're just not ready yet. Providers who abruptly halted abortions on Friday described stunned patients scrambling for options. A lot of questions about why care was not available in Arkansas, but it would be available potentially in Illinois. We are pivoting and saying we used to be a haven, but you've got to get out of this region to get health care. Alabama clinic escort Kathy Zentner says even giving advice could now expose abortion rights advocates to potential prosecution. If it's a felony in Alabama, if you tell anybody how to do something, even if they're going out of state, you're guilty of a felony because you're aiding and abetting something that's against the law in Alabama. She says medication for abortion delivered by mail could be critical. That's going to be survival for a lot of women. There's just no other place to get it. But the pill's also a top target in anti-abortion rights states. And abortion opponents say there are resources for women who are forced or choose to keep their babies. But studies show states with the most restrictive abortion laws have invested the least in policies and programs for women and children. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, there's an extreme heat right now in countries around the world, in parts because of climate change. It was a hot one in the Korean capital, Seoul, with the overnight low, the highest in 25 years. Severe heat waves have been reported in the United States and in Japan, too. This weekend has been a scorcher in parts of Europe, the U.S., and Asia. In Spain and France, it got above 40 degrees Celsius. In the United States, more than 20 million people were under heat alerts in 16 states. Northern and central China got into the 40s as well, with the authorities advising people to avoid activities outdoors. Heavy rains caused flooding in China's south, disrupting the lives of nearly half a million people. The south of China has seen its worst flooding in decades, with Guangdong province on Tuesday raising its alert to the highest level after days of rainfall. In Japan on Saturday, more than 60 regions, including Tokyo, saw temperatures higher than 35 degrees. According to Yomiuri Shinbun, this is the earliest in the summer for it to get that hot in Tokyo since data were first compiled in 1875. The Korean capital of Seoul on Sunday recorded its highest overnight low in 25 years. It never got below 24.6 degrees. In the city Incheon, the overnight low was the highest in 117 years. Decades-long records broken in other cities, too. Heat waves are a phenomenon that's been occurring more frequently in recent years around the world, as shown by a study by the American Meteorological Society. The average number of days between May and September with at least one large heat wave in the northern hemisphere has doubled from 73 in the 1980s to 152 in the 2010s. And the number of days with two or more heat waves in different parts of the hemisphere was seven times higher. Some scientists say more extreme weather events will accompany these heat waves. 
They say a slowdown of air currents can cause heat waves to last longer as temperature differences narrow, keeping weather systems from moving around the planet. They warn global warming could lead to disease, death and poor harvests, which could aggravate global food shortages. Japan's scramble to avert a looming power crunch as temperatures climbed nationwide, with authorities warning of higher than expected demand after the rainy season ended in the capital Tokyo at its earliest since record keeping began. Less than two weeks ahead of an election for the upper house of parliament, surging electrical prices are making life tougher for Japanese customers following higher fuel costs brought by Russian invasion of Ukraine. A power shortage could batter the fortunes of the ruling Liberal Democratic Party already under the fire of its handling of higher consumer prices. Japan's government has urged people in Tokyo and its surrounding area to use less electricity. The Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry expects demand for power to be severe. It said people should switch off unnecessary lights but still use their air conditioning to avoid heat stroke. For weeks, officials have warned of a power crunch as temperatures rise. Officials have also closed several aging fossil fuel plants in an attempt to cut carbon dioxide emissions. These issues, along with the surge in demand for electricity, have resulted in a power squeeze. We have some good news for you. One way to attack cancerous tumours in the liver is a technique called embolization, which blocks blood vessels to kill off cancer cells. A South Korean research team has developed a way to use nanoparticles to apply the technique with more precision. A microscopic wire called a catheter is inserted into a blood vessel. When a substance that can block blood vessels is put into the catheter, the flow of blood and supply of nutrients is cut off. This technique is called embolization and is used to prevent the growth of tumors. When treating cancer, a chemotherapy drug is sometimes injected into blood vessels before they are blocked. But the problem with embolization is that it may be difficult to insert chemotherapy drugs or embolic agents into the veins if they're very small. There's also the risk of the drugs flowing backwards. A South Korean research team has suggested solving this problem by implementing something called medical microrobotic technology. First, anti-cancer drugs are attached to magnetic nanoparticles before being injected into blood vessels. Then, a magnetic field is applied, making it possible to steer and control the nanoparticles precisely in the direction of the tumor. Using a magnetic field to fix embolic agents in place also decreases the risk of backflow. The researchers' primary goal is to develop hepatic artery chemoembolization to treat liver cancer. It is currently the most widely used technique to treat liver cancer and is expected to reach a global market of 2.4 billion U.S. dollars by 2026. The same researchers claim to have demonstrated the technology's feasibility by carrying out experiments on animals. They plan to develop a prototype that can be used on humans over the next five years and then verify its safety and effectiveness through actual clinical practice for another two years. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. World-renowned action movie star Jackie Chan marks the 60th anniversary of his film debut with a live streaming, sharing some untold stories behind his iconic police stories series while expressing gratitude for fan support. A bull running event in Colombia turned deadly when part of the stand collapsed into the ring, killing four people and injuring scores more in the town of El Espinal. An Indonesian villager captured a crocodile measuring more than four meters using a rope, fearing it might threaten the lives and livelihoods of himself and his neighbors. Hundreds of protesters rallied in Madrid to condemn the death of at least 23 migrants by the Moroccan border fence in the aftermath of an attempted mass crossing into Spain. An unassuming patch of red dirt in remote Australia has made history as the site of NASA's first rocket launch from a commercial spaceport outside the US. The launch was also the first in Australia in more than 25 years.
And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. As we leave you tonight, we leave you with Venezuela celebrating to the sound of drums and rattles through the streets and receiving blessings from the local clergy. Stay safe and have a good night.